Uganda Society for the Blind, and other organizations. That's what I have been. I can't say I was, I was not a, a politician. By the time I got married, I was not a politician. But I got involved in the politics when I became the wife of uh, Mr. Apollo Milton Ogote. I think that's enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> for that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, finally, we want to come to Dr. Martin Alike. Uh, Dr. Martin Alike, um, similar question, speaking to um, where you are on Independence Day, uh, your life under colonial rule, but specifically speaking to one event that uh, Mama Mia uh, has, has carefully uh, stayed away from um, on this national event, the wedding day, uh, the 9th of November, uh, you played a very critical role as the best man of Dr. Amo, uh, Apollo Milton Obote. Um, you want to take us through that experience too. Um, doctor, you're welcome. The, uh, the president doesn't like the likes of us. He calls us or our parents or our fathers as colonial collaborators. But that's his own opinion. Uh, on Independence Day, I was living on uh, the road parallel to Wampio. So I just walked with my wife and some other friends I had invited for supper before going to walking up to the field. And there was a lot of excitement and people were very happy. But the Baganda were not happy because the Buganda declared independence from Uganda on the 31st of January, 1961. The reason being that they didn't want a Mukopi to rule over them. That is Kiwaruka of the DP party. So, to say that everybody was happy is not correct. There were some people who were not happy with independence at all. Secondly, I want to state here that if there is anybody who knows a single Ugandan who was shot by the British for clamoring for independence, I am. I want to know who that person is, because as far as I remember, there was nobody ever killed by the British gun for clamoring for independence. Finally, independence. If you 
met somebody on Kampala Road wearing shoes at the time. You looked because there were no shoes for Africans. Africans didn't wear shoes. Servants all, all over the place walked barefoot. Places, King's College Budo was the only school that demanded shoes at that time. Now, one Saturday morning, I would walk down Kampala Road. I would meet a girl. I don't know her. I've never seen her before. She's never seen me before. And I would say to her, and she would say to me, I am walking, I haven't stopped. She's walking, she hasn't stopped. That was Kampala in those days. Now, Milton Obote, I met him when I went to spend a holiday with my friend, Mr. Odu, who was the older son of Jacobo Adoko, Lord Adoko, the father of Akena Adoko. Obote, to me, was not corrupt, and there was no corruption in his time. We did a lot of things on uh, for the good of the country. There was no uh, uh, give me this or, or I, will, I won't do it. I won't do it for you. We bought a head, three houses. He had a house which is on Pala, where his family lives until today. He has a house. He had a house in Lira town and a, a little house in Akokoro where he is buried. So my, I met him in 1941. Now, Obote applied to come to Budo. Had Obote come to Bodo, the history of this country would be different because Obote would have met the Kabaka and he would have met all the top Baganda and he would have spoken Luganda. So my recollection of the man is that he saved me from going to jail because there were people who said to him, if his brother is the Secretary General of Kabakayeka, that is my brother Dawdi Cheng, who was a very close friend of the Kabak, he must be in cahoots. Therefore, get him. And Obuti apparently said that would be crime by association. So I never went to jail. The second, the other thing is, uh, if you applied for a scholarship, and I was the chair, chairman of the Central Scholarships Committee. We did not ask you to show us what religion you are, what school you went to, what tribe you were. We just so looked at your papers, index number, and we gave you a scholarship. And at the time I was there, we had 5,000 students in the United Kingdom. And 
if you ask them, including Justice Kanye Hamba and many others who went to the UK at that time, did they committee ask you any question about tribe? The answer would be no. If he says yes, you tell him that I think he's a liar because we never asked you what tribe you are. And we, we, we didn't get paid, by the way. We never got paid. We were doing it for the country. So that was my recollection of that day. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for our panelists, retired Bishop Ochola, Mama Mia, Honorable Joyce, uh, Dr. Ren, and Dr. Martin Alike. Allowed to say something about Miria. Miria, I think, met Milton in my house. <laughs> <laughs> because those people going to Lejko from the north were so poor and they could not afford to go to drink in public places. So they would come to my house after Lejko and my wife was young and used to run around with Miria, Kalule, uh, Joyce, Masembe, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sentongo, and uh, one other girl whose name I forget, she was a teacher in the uh, Zambia Police School. And Milton Obote proposed to Ms. Kalule. And the day he announced who the best man was going to be, there were many members of the cabinet present. And one of them, when my name was in, mentioned, instead of his name, he collapsed. on the floor and Miria was there. And I think it was Miria who asked Milton to ask me to be their chairman. Uh, when we uh, left Namirembe, uh, going to the Lugogo Stadium, we, uh, Joyce, my assembly, ran down the backside to meet us, to wave to Miria. And I remember her saying, Oh, Miria, who is it? <laughs> now, the government invited 2,000 people. Obote invited 1,800 people, and it was a big to-do. The breweries donated all the beer, so people drank, drank, drank. And one of the gentlemen was Dr. Kewalanga, a very uh, prominent surgeon at the time. Uh, he got so drunk, he fell into the gutter. He was from Masaka. <laughs> and uh, the next day, he was asked, do you remember anything? He replied, was, I think in Namanya. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, once again, put your hands together for our panel. Your Excellency, Dr. Martin Alike said, uh, Dr. Bote, if Dr. Bote had gone to Budo, he probably would have learned some Luganda and uh, met the Kabaka. And he went to another great school, Busoga College Mwiri, where myself and the managing director, UBC, went. And that is how he became prime minister and later president of Uganda. So I would probably think he may not have become president if he had gone to Budo. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we want to thank you for your time. Apologies, we had to run, over, uh, run uh, over the time we had been provided. But I want to thank the panel. Over to you, Master of Ceremonies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maurice, uh, for that uh, wonderful engagement with our dear uh, panelists, distinguished panelists, it has been quite an exciting uh, discussion, recollecting the memories of what happened then and uh, partly how it progressed up to today. There was a tint of romanticism uh, during the time and we very much welcome it. We've seen two books come out of uh, uh, this distinguished panel. I think we've seen one from Dr. Martin Alike, we've seen one from Madame Joyce Mpanga, uh, hopefully we'll get more and uh, have this record properly put and uh, recorded for eternity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, time has moved a little bit. Your Excellency, I now want to request and invite uh, the Permanent Secretary to come and make her remarks and thereafter invite uh, the Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you. Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, Right Honorable Dr. Rugunda, our ex-Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers present, our elders, the distinguished panelists who have just given us very exciting stories, representatives of the diplomatic missions, particularly the British High Commissioner, private sector representatives, the academia, including our curators who put up this wonderful exhibition, staff of the ministry and its agencies, the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Your Excellency, let me take this opportunity to officially welcome you to the Uganda Museum. Since October 1962, when President Milton Obote opened the Independence Pavilion Gallery, which is just behind you, 60 years ago, you are the first sitting president of Uganda to visit the Uganda Museum. <laughs> Making this a historic moment for us as a sector. Your Excellency, this museum was established in 1908. It was the first museum in East Africa, followed by Kenya and later Tanzania. The first museum building was located at Fort Lugard, transferred to Makere School of Fine Art, and later here to its final home in 1954. Your Excellency, the National Museum forms part of our history and that's why we decided to mark this Uganda at 60 celebration as we memorize the past and be able to shape the future. Your Excellency, the Independence Pavilion right behind you was constructed in memory of our independence and there is a monumental plaque of former President Milton Obote who officiated at the opening of the exhibition and that exhibition attracted over 163,000 international visitors to the Uganda National Museum within three months after that exhibition. <laughs> Uganda, Your Excellency, is blessed with diverse cultures and scenic sites. As a ministry, we have documented in total 650 sites 
A few of these have been developed, though not yet to international standards. Recently, Your Excellency, the 11th Parliament passed the Museums and Monuments Bill, which has addressed several challenges that had impinged the development of these sites for economic transformation. Your Excellency, for Uganda and Ugandans to easily benefit from the diverse heritage sites and culture and to sustainably manage and develop Uganda's cultural heritage resources, the government needs to invest adequate resources in the tourism sector. Your Excellency, most of our sites are in remote areas, and if developed, communities can get jobs and earn income through other auxiliary operations, such as health selling handicrafts, offering hospitality services, and agricultural produce, among others. Your Excellency, the Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, is currently implementing strategies, policies, and plans aimed at harnessing the tourism potential through diversification of tourism products and widening the product range. Today, Your Excellency, your coming to the Uganda Museum makes a big statement and gives us mileage to our sector, and we strongly believe that the Uganda Museum, especially at this time of the Uganda at 60, will receive more visitors than we have seen in the past as a result of your visit. As we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, Your Excellency, we request that you take time off from your busy schedule and visit some of our sites. When we came to State House a few months ago, Your Excellency, the tour operators requested you to take off time and visit some of our national parks. I know you said that we should wait for the COVID, but maybe this is a, a reminder. But personally, I wanted to request Your Excellency that you could start with the Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Center, popularly known as the Entebbe Zoo, which is just a stone's throw from you. And you can see what a good job we are doing in conservation education. But you could also visit a few of the other sites and that will help us to promote both domestic and international tourism. Uh, I would like to take this time to recognize the exhibition team, particularly Professor Peter, Peterson Derrick and Dr. Kanakwa, the curators of the Independence at 60 National History Exhibition, the staff of the Department of Museums and Monuments, who have worked tirelessly to put this exhibition together. We thank you. Uh, we would also like to take this opportunity to invite our two operators to add this museum to their itineraries and bring their clients to the National History Exhibition and the Uganda Museum at large. Your Excellency, there is a writer called Posnaske who in 1963 said that the Uganda Museum has the finest ethnographic exhibition in Africa. The Ministry is working hard to refurbish the National Museum and have it expanded to fit international standards as well as making it a must-see site in Kampala. <laughs> Your Excellency, we, re we received funding from the World Bank, a loan which you approved and under a project called Competitiveness and Enterprise Development Project. And under this project, I just wanted to remind Your Excellency that when you approved that project, because you, in the recent past, you're approving all loans to Uganda, and in your comments, personal comments, you said that the objectives of the project were not very clear to you, but if it is going to help us to build and upgrade our hospitality school in Jinja, then you approved it. But I would like to take this opportunity to inform Your Excellency that that project is not only going to upgrade the hospitality, the training school in Jinja, it is also going to do the Uganda Museum. We are going to expand, modernize, and digitize the museum. And we look forward 
to inviting you back here maybe by the end of 2024 to commission the new museum. <laughs> Your Excellency, we shall be delighted to have you in the near future commissioning a number of these projects that we are working on. I would like to thank you, Your Excellency, for taking time to be with us and waiting, waiting patiently. And I'd like to, at this point, to ask you to allow me to request the Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, Honorable Tom Butime, to address you and to address the congregation. Thank you. Uh, Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda, the Right Honorable Dr. Hakana Rugunda, Honorable Ministers here, the High Commissioner of the United Kingdom, the PS, heads of agencies, the distinguished panelists today, ladies and gentlemen, your Excellency, the Ministry of Tourism is delighted to host you at a time when the museums and monuments to bill has just been passed and you are waiting for you to assent to that bill, then it will become law. The Uganda at Sikiste exhibition has come at a time when the Ministry is planning to refurbish the, the National Museum. This is part of the sector strategy to develop a museum of international standard. And it suffices to say what the PS has already said, that the Uganda Museum here holds the finest ethnographic exhibitions in the whole of Africa. The cultures and history of this nation is kept in this national repository. Now, Your Excellency, according to UNESCO, a museum means a not-for-profit permanent institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage, open to the public, accessible, inclusive, museums foster diversity and sustainability. They operate and communicate ethically, professionally, and with the participation of the communities, offering varied experiences for education, enjoyment, reflection, and knowledge sharing. That's what will be happening at this place. So, Your Excellency, the Minister of Tourism, through the Department of Museums and Monuments, has been partnering with the University of Michigan for the last 30 years. The current collaboration has a theme, Rethinking the Uganda Museum, Transporting Histories. As part of this project, which is also involves Makerere University History Department, the team began with Amin's exhibitions and seen archives, while, which attracted 20,000 domestic and international tourists in 2019 alone. This was because of the panel discussions that were live on our national television that featured the late Agre Awori, the National Museum was able to document the history of 1971 through Agri Awori's discussion, who was the director of Uganda Television at the time Ida Min took over government. Today and this month, Ugandans memorize the year and the day the Union Jack was lowered at Kololo as a mark of freedom. The processes to attaining this freedom began as early as 1950s, and at that time there were many pro-independence movements of different groups in Uganda, Eastern, and Western Uganda. 
Your Excellency, you have seen, you could have seen more, that women also had started agitating for their rights, even before independence. Once again, I would like to thank Your Excellency for your leadership. For today, Uganda is leading with a bigger and a big percentage of women in leadership, in professions, in academia, and indeed they are doing very well in driving the economy. It is against this background that the Ministry of Tourism, in collaboration with the University of Michigan and Makerere University, developed this exhibition with the aim of transporting history to the public for them to cherish independence. I want to thank the exhibition team led by Professor Derek Peterson, with whom I had an opportunity to work with at the Mount of the Moon University in Fort Porto, Dr. Pamela Kanakwa from Makere, and the staff of the museum for putting this exhibition together. I also would like to recognize the senior citizens who allowed to be interviewed and also loaned this museum their precious and historical artifacts. Allow me to recognize Mama Miria Obote, Mrs. Joyce Mpanga, the family of the late um, Benedict of Wanuka, Dr. Martin Aliker, the late Reverend Ochola, Bishop Emeritus, the late Honorable Dr. Hakanaragunda, and the children of the families who will still be with us tomorrow as we listen and learn from them how they perceived independence at that time. I now request your excellency to address this congregation and the country. Asante Kabisa. Uh, the Right Honorable Dr. Wunda, Prime Minister Emeritus, the ministers, members of parliament, members of the diplomatic corps, the elders who have uh, graced this occasion, the panel, and all the invited people here. When I was going through the exhibition, Dr. Kanako was very busy trying to explain to me, but I told her that what you call history, I call current affairs. <laughs> Although I'm not, I was not in Kampala, but I was in Mbarara, following everything that was going on. So all those pictures you, you, you are showing there, I, I remember them very well. And of course, either I will get a cow from Dr. Kanakwa, or I will give her a cow. If it turns out that I am right, that the speaker at independence, or right before independence, where the white man called something slayed. If I am right, then Dr. Kanako will give me a cow. If I am wrong, then I will give her a cow. Have you checked what was who, slayed? Slayed was. Joyce knows, when did Slade stop being the speaker? Slade. Joyce, Joyce, Joyce knows. By the time she was in the late, late, in the late call, was Slade the speaker or? 
The speaker at Independence was Mr. Patel. Narendra Patel. Narendra Patel. But, but, but Slade, Slade, what, what, what Your Excellency, you Dr. Like disagrees. Uh -huh. I think the president is right. Oh, I've got the cow. <laughs> <laughs> The Patel was elected later. You hear the pass, Mr. Yarike, please. Ko yes. Ko ko konywa? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Patel was elected later on, and when kicked out in 1972, he went and became the Speaker of the House of Queensland in Australia. Oh, okay. So, Dr. Kanako Adekao, where... You, you check the, so the other man who, the speaker who is in the picture, is he a white man or an Indian? He's a white man, he's is Slade. Slade is the one, I remember very, because you know, this time, I had just turned 18 years old, but I was a very avid, avid follower of, all events that were going on in the country. So I, I, I remember everything like as if it was yesterday. Now, as you hear, the elders there were telling you uh, aspects of the life of Uganda. And as you heard, it was a mixed story. There was a lot of anticipation and jubilation, but as Dr. Arika pointed out, there were also some simmering problems because mainly of what the NRM later came to, to, to challenge as a wrong ideology, ideology of tribes, of, of religion and so on. That's how eventually we got into all sorts of problems. And as you heard, many of the panelists here lived in exile. You had Bishop Ochoa telling you how he lived in, in, in the Congo, uh, how Dr. Rika ran to Kenya, Mama Miria, I was with her in Tanzania and later in Zambia. So, and you had uh, the professionals like uh, Dr. Olwen, how he spent a lot of time working outside. You had him, what he was working in Australia, in those places, those places, because the situation here was not, not good. So, it's good that uh, you had uh, Dr. Alika talking about people without shoes on Kampala Road. You do find people walking without shoes. You had Bishop uh, Ochora telling you that there was an unfair division of labor where Uganda was to produce cash crops and the North was to produce soldiers for the colonial army. Those reflections are important for you, the young people, to, to, to really pick up properly. Then you heard how there was not a single secondary school in the north. Uh, and I know this, because even, even, even in my time, by the time I came to S1, Ntare, 1961, there were only about six A-level schools in the whole of Uganda. You heard about, uh, Professor Wayne was talking about it, he was talking, talked, uh, but by 61, there was Budo, Chisubi, Ntare. I did not know about the Indian school he talked about in Mbare. I did not know about it. Uh, Gayaza, Namagunga, 
And somebody told me of Nabingo, but me, I did not remember that. These were the only A-level schools in the whole of Uganda by 1961, just before independence. The, so there were so many problems uh, that the independence uh, control, independent country of Uganda started with. But in the 70 years, we were with the British. There were also some, some uh, uh, benefits. The introduction of modern education, if, if, although small, you had uh, what uh, Dr. Orange said. Uh, even us, by that time, who had started going into the educational system. Uh, the, by coincidence, my aunt, who is your permanent secretary in the ministry, Katsime, uh, the, the, she has got an interesting, uh, an interesting story which should be put in the museum here also. Because she's a, she's a permanent secretary for a museum. Her, her father actually, no, her grandfather, Aron Muhinda, was rescued by the British in Mombasa, where he had been taken as a, as a slave, he had been captured as a slave, the grandfather of your peers here, in Mombasa. He is, she's from my mother's clan, but I, I think she needs to tell us the story how, how he got captured and taken to Mombasa and was freed there by the British. And when he got free, he married uh, another Munyoro girl who had also been kidnapped and taken to Mombasa. And they produced a boy called Cook. Cook, you can hear Cook, after Albert Cook, the other doctor. Uh, and that Cook is the father of Katsusime here. So there you have got a very important museum. <laughs> So it, it, the, the, there were definitely advantages uh, w w w being exposed to the, to the British, to the Europeans. Now, I tend to blame our indigenous leaders. These leaders were not waking up because these foreigners, because the, the, what they call the tribes here, are essentially similar groups. If you go to the north, you will find the, our Luo people. They, all, they are all Luo people. They are all, they are all connected. They are, they are Lur, the Achori, the Langi, the Kumam, the, the Japadora, the, the Luo in Kenya, the ones in South Sudan. They are the same people, the ones in Congo. And here, the Bantu, the Bantu people here, especially these Bantus near the lakes, they actually speak one language, but with different dialects. But the problem was that our egocentric kings and chiefs were emphasizing parochialism instead of looking for the similarities among our people. This is where I, I don't agree with the traditionalist uh, groups. Because when you look at all what, especially like the, what they call the interlocutory Bantu, they, they're just one language. So I don't know whether your museum will also bring out that, that aspect. Because when you say ethnography, to emphasize the separateness 
rather than the commonality. I have a problem with that approach because uh, like recently, I have been telling you the slogan, Okora Echida Kionka, a translation for subsistence farming. I, I got this from the Bawere, the Bawere of, of Parisa, Budaka. They are the ones who speak like that. Because when I was talking of looking at subsistence, farming, subsistence, working only for, for the stomach in Rinyankore, they say, Okora and Ayonka in Rinyankore. But when I went to, it's all, all the way from uh, the, Bachiga, Batoro, Banyoro, all this Balamoji, all the way to Budaka, you can imagine, you can see the distance. And, and through Tanzania, Buhaya, up to all, almost near Mwanza, even Rwanda and Burundi, they would change a little bit. They would change a little bit. But I liked the Bagwere version because they really made fun of the whole thing by saying your core chida kyonka. So this is the one I prefer. I say Okora <laughs> Echida Kyonka. So this is one 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 language. But spoken slightly differently and there. But you find the these tra tra traditional group the, the old groups emphasizing the separateness of, of, of our people rather than the, the commonalities. Now, when you go to Germany, I am told that the German, which was written by Martin Luther in the Bible, was the German of Saxony. I think Martin Luther was coming from Saxony. And when you ask the Germans of Bavaria, they say, we can't understand what that German is unless you learn it. But here, even without learning in Uganda, when Bishop Leslie Brown came to preach in, uh, in, in Tungamo, my, my church, in 1954, he was speaking in Uganda. And he said, I could understand, I was in P2, but I could understand, oh, that's how the Waganda call uh, Oksiga, Okubiba, in Rinyankwere, the Waganda call it Oksiga. The word Oksiga is also there in Rinyankwere, but it is used for petitioning the traditional gods. You go and present your, your issues to the to the spirits, and then they answer you. That's what they call Oksiga, to, to present your... So I could straight away understand what Bishop Brown was saying, although I had never had anybody speaking in Uganda. So therefore, the, the, our NRM point of view is that no, yes, it is good to remember this, uh, the history, but we must tra transcend, transcend the parochialist point of view because our prosperity will be served better by integration rather than emphasizing the, the parochialism. So therefore, I'm very happy to, I, I want to thank the Professor Patterson, Patterson or Peterson? Petero? Yeah, Petero, no? Oh. So I want to thank Professor Peterson and Dr. Kanakwa for unearthing this heritage because the, these communities here, 
are really powerful communities. Our only problem was governance. If you look at uh, people like those Banyankore, a very powerful group. We have got everything. I keep telling you that I'm 78 now, a bit junior to the elders there, but also not to be neglected in terms of, of biological progression. But I eat only African foods. I never eat, I, I don't eat bread because I'm not a European. I don't eat uh, rice because I'm not an Indian. I eat our foods. Akalo, millet, muhogo. The only non-Ugandan food I eat is Irish potatoes of Monde. Of Mondovo, those of Mondo, I eat them because they have, got, they have got low starch. They are not as starch. I eat, them, I, I eat a little bit one at night because I don't want too much starch at night. Then I eat our other indigenous, the, the, the vegetables and so on. So, like food, food, we have got every type of food here. Fish. Uh, po uh, sweet potatoes, all those foods, we, 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 they were indigenous here. Medicine, so on. So our only problem was always with the governance, the chiefs, the chiefs uh, not waking up. Okay, when we were alone, without external pressures, maybe they didn't understand the importance. After all, the population was not so big, so th these kingdoms were self-sufficient in, uh, in what they needed. But w when we were exposed to the foreigners who came, because the, 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 the exposure of Africa started with, actually with the, the fall of Constantinople to the Turkish in 1453, when the Ottoman tax captured Constantinople and cut off Western Europe from the East, from China and India, from the, uh, the Silk Road, they were calling it. You have heard the Chinese president talking about the Silk Road these days. That trade route from East to West, founded by Marco Polo, some many, some centuries before, was cut when the Ottoman tax took over Constantinople, what they call now Istanbul. That's when the Europeans now started looking for another route to the east, the sea route, led by the Portuguese. And you can see it didn't take long. 1453, the Ottoman takes take over Istanbul. By, eight, by 1482, the Portuguese were, were where Angola is, a man called Diego Kama, a Portuguese. By 1487, a Portuguese man called Bartholomew Diaz got to the, to the Cape of Good Hope. That's why they call it the Cape of Good Hope. They saw the African coast going uh, north. Then they knew that they were about to go around the continent. And 1498, Vasco da Gama went around the Cape and landed at uh, Natal on Christmas Day. That's why they called that place Natal, Nativity in Latin. Now, from that time, the Europeans started coming along our coast. This should have woken up the chiefs to, to wake up and say, no, 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 we better get together to, to protect ourselves. But they didn't. They said just full of, of, of egoism. Until Huntington speak gets here, 1862. 
This is almost uh, 400 years from the time of Vasco da Gama. And me, from the clans of here, because the, 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 I am from one of, of the most ancient clans here, we have the stories we are coming that people, are, some strong people are coming from abroad. There was even a prophet called Kakarakashagama from Karagwe, from Tanzania, who was prophesying that you people, if you don't wake up, this land will be taken by foreigners. He was prophesying that, that man from Tanzania, from Karagwe. But anyway, it's so good that we have survived all those problems. We are now here. It's so good that we capture this heritage, but capture it also with a progressive angle, not just a frozen way. Among the people who expose the history are the archaeologists. Katsushime talked to Professor Posnaske. I don't know whether he's still alive. He used to come here. He used to come some, some time ago. But there are others, like our teacher at the University of Dar es Salaam, Dr. Sa Sutton. How do you pronounce it? Is it Sutton or Sutton or what? Sutton. This is a problem with the English. They don't, they write you, they say A. What, what is the A now? That's where, where the Bantu dialects are very clear. The way you speak is the way you write. But the English, S-U. Then S-A, where is the Saturn now? I, I don't see it here. So that Dr. Saturn wrote a good piece after they did the work at Begovia Mjenyi and Tutsi, which, which I like very much. And I want to engage those archaeologists because you could see that they, they have some information, but it's not enough because they don't know our, 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 our culture. They don't know. For instance, one of the pieces I read I think it was written by, uh, by Saturn, saying that when they dug up the bones of the cows at uh, Aidan Tutsi or Vigo, that they found that all these bones were of young calves. So according to the European mind, they said, oh, this must be a ritual a ritual, a religious ritual. Because why were they only slaughtering young cows? They, they don't, this is because they don't know our culture. And, and, and the people they were inter interacting with could not tell them. But among those groups, we don't eat adult cows. It is, it is a, a sacrilege to eat an adult cow. You don't slaughter a cow. Cows are not for slaughtering, but we slaughter young bull calves because we don't need them. Somebody like Tumsim there would tell you it is called Octarian Tramutwe. You prefer the female calves, a nyana. So if the cow produces a numi, a, a, a bull calf, you, you kill it and eat it so that the, the mother, you see the English don't have enough words, they say dries up. The, when the cow stops milking, they say it has dried up, dried up. But for us, we, of course, we have got more words. It's called okwesa, so that the mother stops producing milk and therefore co conceives again to, to bring another, uh, another calf. So, but, but I really liked the work of, of Dr. Sutton and I, I want to engage those archaeologists so that we can interpret that information with our, our own local knowledge which we have here. So I thank everybody involved. Thank you so much. I thank the elders. The elders have really entertained you people, the young people. 
I think it, this is hilarious. You have, you have heard what they were all saying. It's like a film they were telling you. Uh, Mama Miria, Joyce, you see how they were really adventurous in all these areas. And, and Dr. Alika told you how the girls were going around and not asking too many questions. <laughs> so it's, it, I think it's very good to capture these stories because the, 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 these are live, these are live libraries here. Uh, and I'm also a junior. I'm also a junior library, not as senior as these ones, but also. Uh, a, 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 a junior one. Uh, but I must tell you about uh, how Dr. Alika gave me a nice lunch in Nairobi. Because when he ran from here, he, was, he, he went to Nairobi and he opened uh, a dental clinic there. So in our fight against uh, Idi Amin, uh, somehow, one day I linked up with him, I don't know through whom, uh, together with uh, an, a Tanzanian army officer who was working with me underground to uh, coming here and going back. Uh, he gave us a very nice lunch in one of those places in Nairobi. So I congratulate everybody. Thank you for taking this Rubimbi. Or Rubimbi, how do you say it in English now? Huh? Kanako, you come and translate in the six or what? Who will translate or be in B? Your Excellency, I would take that to mean uh, task. Hmm? Task. Task, yes. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> Who, 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 who can try better than Kanakwa? And yes, all of Tops of Chus or Vimbi. When you call it or Jesi, in actually they call it Katara. Huh? Who can translate it? Because task. Huh? But, but anyway, it, 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 it is, uh, this is, when, when in our traditional setting, when we are cultivating, each one takes his or her line of responsibility. I, I have my Rubimbi, we are abreast. I have mine, you have yours. And, 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 and each one cultivates his portion, the, 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 the assignment, you can call it assignment or something like that. So this will be, of course, some of us are busy with other mimbis. We are busy with other things, economy, what, uh, corona, Ebola, all this. Now, somebody to remember that, no, we must, we must uh, this will be, should not be forgotten. I thank you so much. And I salute you because definitely, if you had not remembered this Ruvimbi, I, I, I think it, it could, we could have lost a lot of resources, of, of information. Uh, and those sources you are talking about, they are very rich sources, the pictures, the what? How about the 1940s? Because uh, my father told me that uh, the British used to come and make films in the villages, but I never, where are they, those films of the 1940s? We are talking of 1950s, 60s. How about the 1940s? What happened to them? The archives people. The 1940s, 30s, and you have many of you. Your Excellency, Derek should be able to speak to this. Derek Peterson. But Your Excellency, as he walks to the mic, he also came to me and whispered that the speaker wasn't actually Mr. Slane, oh. 
but uh, he will also tell us who the speaker at independence was oh, very because good. he says the speaker slain was actually the speaker in kenya not oh. here yes. oh well, i have lost my cow no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm happy to say, Your Excellency, that the Uganda Broadcasting Corporation has a very impressive cinema archive that we're currently working to digitize, uh, including films from the 1950s and 60s, which we hope to be available soon. In fact, there's a film. 50s and the 40s, 30s? 40s and 30s, most of those live in British archives in Getty or Reuters. We've been able to use some of them for a special film that the audience here watched while we were awaiting uh, your arrival. They are there in the UK? They're in the UK, that's right. Okay. Yeah. And who are the speaker? Please help me. <laughs> What's that? Griffin. Griffin. The name is John Griffin. Your ah, Griffin, Griffin. Right. Griffin. The same is one of Kenya. Uh, I have lost my cow from... Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, and I congratulate everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me once again in appreciating His Excellency the President for that very visionary talk and directional thoughts in setting the tone uh, for this important occasion as we celebrate Uganda at 60. Your Excellency, we marvel at your recollection of history and uh, the facts of the world and Uganda, though I think uh, the cow has gone, but uh, <laughs> uh, we, we marvel at that greatly. Thank you so much. We thank you once again for gracing this important occasion, recounting the history and events of the time. We believe it will reawaken the sense of common identity and foster unity as we celebrate Uganda at 60. Ladies and gentlemen, we've uh, come to the close of this event, and I would like to invite you to stand as we take on the anthems. And uh, thereafter, we will have uh, a small photo session. I think the protocol will guide us on how that will work. The anthems, please. <laughs> Thank you once again.